Ams. The Story of Doctor Doolittle by Hugh Lofting, abridged by Taylor Seth Hall. Part Two: The Voyage to Africa. Once, when Doctor Doolittle was sitting on his garden wall, an Italian man came round with a monkey on a string. The doctor saw at once that the monkey's collar was too tight and that he was dirty and unhappy. So he took the monkey away from the Italian, gave the man a shilling, and told him to go. But the man got awfully angry and said that he wanted to keep the monkey. But the doctor told him that if he didn't go away, he would punch him on the nose. John Doolittle was a strong man, though he wasn't very tall. So the Italian went away, saying rude things, and the monkey stayed with Doctor Doolittle and had a good home. The other animals in the house called him Chichi, which is a common word in monkey language meaning ginger. And another time, when the circus came to Puddleby, the crocodile, who had a bad toothache, escaped at night and came into the doctor's garden. The doctor talked to him in crocodile language and took him into the house and made his tooth better. But when the crocodile saw what a nice house it was, with all the different places for the different kinds of animals, he too wanted to live with the doctor. He asked, "Couldn't he sleep in the fish pond at the bottom of the garden if he promised not to eat the fish?" When the circus men came to take him back, he got so wild and savage that he frightened them away. But to every one in the house, he was always as gentle as a kitten. But now the old ladies grew afraid to send their lap dogs to Doctor Doolittle because of the crocodile, and the farmers wouldn't believe that he would not eat the lambs and sick calves they brought to be cured. So the doctor went to the crocodile and told him he must go back to his circus. But he wept such big tears and begged so hard to be allowed to stay that the doctor hadn't the heart to turn him out. So then the doctor's sister came to him and said. John, you must send that creature away. Now the farmers and the old ladies are afraid to send their animals to you. Just as we were beginning to be well off again, now we shall be ruined entirely. This is the last straw. I will no longer be housekeeper for you if you don't send away that alligator. It isn't an alligator," said the doctor. "It's a crocodile." I don't care what you call it," said his sister. "It's a nasty thing to find under the bed. I won't have it in the house." But he has promised me," the doctor answered, "that he will not bite anyone. He doesn't like the circus, and I haven't the money to send him back to Africa, where he comes from. If you don't send him away this minute," said Sarah, "I'll, I'll go and get married." All right," said the doctor. "Go and get married. It can't be helped." And he took down his hat and went out into the garden. So Sarah Doolittle packed up her bags and went off. And the doctor was left all alone with his animal family. And very soon he was poorer than he'd ever been before, with all these mouths to fill and the house to look after, and no one to do the mending and no money coming in. Things began to look very difficult. But the doctor didn't worry at all. Money is a nuisance, he used to say. We'd all be much better off if it had never been invented. What does money matter so long as we are happy? But soon the animals themselves began to get worried, and one evening, when the doctor was asleep in his chair before the kitchen fire, they began talking it over among themselves in whispers. And the owl Tutu, who was good at arithmetic, figured it out that there was only money enough left to last another week if they each had one meal a day and no more. Then the parrot said. I think we all ought to do the housework ourselves. At least we can do that much. After all, it is for our sakes that the old man finds himself so lonely and so poor. So it was agreed that the monkey Chee Chee was to do the cooking and mending, the dog was to sweep the floors, the duck was to dust and make the beds, the owl was to keep the accounts, and the pig was to do the gardening. They made Polynesia the parrot housekeeper and laundress because she was the oldest. Of course, at first they all found their new jobs very hard to do, but they soon got used to it, and they used to think it great fun to watch Jip the dog sweeping his tail over the floor like a broom. 
After a little, they got to do the work so well that the doctor said that he had never had his house kept so tidy or so clean before. In this way, things went along all right for a while, but without money they found it very hard. When the parrot came to the doctor and told him that the fishmonger wouldn't give them any more fish, he said, Never mind, so long as the hens lay eggs and the cows give milk, we can have omelettes and yoghurt. And there are plenty of vegetables left in the garden. The winter is still a long way off. Don't fuss. But the snow came earlier than usual that year, and although the old horse hauled in plenty of wood from the forest outside the town, most of the vegetables in the garden were gone, and the rest were covered with snow, and many of the animals were very hungry. That winter was a cold one, and one night in December, when they were all sitting round the warm fire in the kitchen, and the doctor was reading aloud to them out of books he had written himself in animal language, the owl, Tutu, suddenly said, Shh! What's that noise outside? They all listened, and presently they heard the sound of someone running. Then the door flew open, and the monkey, Chi-Chi, ran in badly out of breath. Doctor! he cried. I've just had a message from a cousin of mine in Africa. There is a terrible sickness among the monkeys out there. They are all catching it, and they are dying in hundreds. They have heard of you, and beg you to come to Africa to stop the sickness. Who brought the message? asked the doctor, taking off his spectacles and laying down his book. A swallow, said Chi-Chi. She is outside on the rain barrel. Bring her in by the fire, said the doctor. She must be perished with cold. The swallows flew south six weeks ago. So the swallow was brought in, all huddled and shivering, and although she was a little afraid at first, she soon got warmed up and sat on the edge of the mantelpiece and began to talk. When she had finished, the doctor said, I would gladly go to Africa, especially in this bitter weather, but I'm afraid we haven't money enough to buy the tickets. Dear me, what a nuisance money is, to be sure. Well, perhaps if I go down to the seaside I shall be able to borrow a boat. I knew a sailor once who brought his baby to me with measles. The baby got well, maybe he'll lend us his boat. Then the crocodile, the monkey, and the parrot were very glad and began to sing, because they were going back to Africa, their real home. I shall only be able to take you three with Jip the dog, Dab-Dab the duck, Gub-Gub the pig, and the owl Tutu. The rest of the animals, like the dormice and the water voles and the bats, they will have to go back and live in the fields where they were born till we come home again. But as most of them sleep through the winter, they won't mind that. And besides, it wouldn't be good for them to go to Africa. Polynesia the parrot, who had been on long sea voyages before, began telling the doctor all the things he would have to take with him on his ship. And you must have an anchor. I expect the ship will have its own anchor, said the doctor. Well, make sure, said Polynesia, because it's very important. You can't stop if you haven't got an anchor, and you'll need a bell. What's that for? asked the doctor. To tell the time by, said the parrot. You go and ring it every half hour, and then you know what time it is. And bring a whole lot of rope. It always comes in handy on voyages. Then they began to wonder where they were going to get the money to buy all the things they needed. Oh, bother it! Money again, cried the doctor. Goodness, I shall be glad to get to Africa where we don't have to have any. I'll go and ask the grocer if he will wait for his money till I get back. So he went to see the sailor and the grocer, and presently he came back with all the things they wanted. Then the animals packed up, and after they had turned off the water so the pipes wouldn't freeze, they closed the house and gave the key to the old horse who lived in the stable. And when they had seen that there was plenty of hay in the loft to last the horse through winter, they carried all their luggage down to the seashore and got on to the boat. As soon as they were on the ship, Gub-Gub the pig asked where the beds were, for it was four o'clock in the afternoon and he wanted his nap. Polynesia took him downstairs into the inside of the ship and showed him the beds set all on top of one another like bookshelves against a wall. <coughs> that isn't a bed, cried Gub-Gub. That's a shelf. <coughs> beds are always like that on ships, said the parrot. It isn't a shelf. Climb up into it and go to sleep. That's what you call a bunk. 
I don't think I'll go to bed yet, said Gub Gub. I'm too excited. I want to go upstairs and see them start. They were just going to start on their journey when the doctor said he would have to go back and ask the sailor the way to Africa. But the swallow said she had been to that country many times and would show them how to get there. So the doctor told Chi-Chi to pull up the anchor and the voyage began. For six whole weeks they went sailing on and on, over the rolling sea, following the swallow who flew before the ship to show them the way. At night she carried a tiny lantern, so they should not miss her in the dark, and the people on the other ships that passed said that the light must be a shooting star. As they sailed further and further into the south, it got warmer and warmer. Polynesia, Chi-Chi, and the crocodile enjoyed the hot sun no end. They ran about laughing and looking over the side of the ship to see if they could see Africa yet. But the pig and the dog and the owl could do nothing in such weather, but sat at the end of the ship in the shade of a big barrel, with their tongues hanging out drinking lemonade. Dab-Dab the duck used to keep herself cool by jumping into the sea and swimming behind the ship, and every once in a while, when the top of her head got too hot, she would dive under the ship and come up on the other side. When they got nearer to the equator, they saw some flying fishes coming towards them, and the fishes asked the parrot if this was Dr. Doolittle's ship. When she told them that it was, they said they were glad, because the monkeys in Africa were getting worried that he would never come. Polynesia asked them how many miles they had yet to go, and the flying fishes said it was only fifty-five miles now to the coast of Africa. And another time a whole school of porpoises came dancing through the waves, and they too asked Polynesia if this was the ship of the famous doctor. And when they heard that it was, they asked the parrot if the doctor wanted anything for his journey. And Polynesia said, Yes, we have run short of onions. There is an island not far from here, said the porpoises, where the wild onions grow tall and strong. Keep straight on and we will get some and catch up to you. So the porpoises dashed away through the sea, and very soon the parrot saw them again, coming up behind, dragging the onions through the waves in big nets made of seaweed. The next evening, as the sun was going down, the doctor said, Get me the telescope, Chi-Chi. Our journey is nearly ended. Very soon you should be able to see the shores of Africa. Dear old Africa, sighed Polynesia, it's good to be back, and it hasn't changed a bit. Same old palm trees, same old red earth, same old black ants. There's no place like home. And the others noticed she had tears in her eyes. She was so pleased to see her country once again. Next week on the Storytime Classics podcast, Dr. Doolittle and his animal friends journey through the jungle and meet an angry lion.